Hi, I'm Sharon Spangler. Welcome to this Council Connection. We have a very special program for you. We have elected officials from all over the state of Nevada with us. They're here for an executive board of the Nevada League of Cities. And Jessica Sferraza is the president of the league. And I thought we would start with Mike. Why don't you tell us who you are, what your role is with the executive board, and what you do for the city of Elko? Well, it's simple. I'm a I'm Mike Franzo, I'm the mayor of the city of Elko. I'm currently the immediate past president of Beluga Cities. I've served actually the presidency twice. So I've been mayor 15 years in the city of Elko and, uh, and that, so I'm on the last uh, run, if you will. So this is exciting. Uh, I'm Dave Bennett from the city of Mesquite and uh, I've been on the board now. Um, I'm the first vice president after Jessica and uh, uh, I am a city councilman from the city of Mesquite. I've been there for 11 years as an elected official and um, just looking forward to serving again this next year in the capacity of president. Great. And I am Las Vegas City Councilman Steve Ross representing the Great Northwest Board 6 in the city of Las Vegas. <laughs> And I'm the Secretary Treasurer of the Nevada League of Cities and uh, certainly glad to be here. Great. Ricky? I'm Las Vegas City Councilman Ricky Barlow. I am uh, the representative of Fabulous Ward 5 in the City of Las Vegas <laughs> and also a member of the National League of Cities in Nevada as well as the um, member of the Economic Development for the National League of Cities as well. And right. really uh, blessed and honored to be a part of this great board. I'm Jessica Sarraza, proud member of the Reno City Council, uh, serve on Ward 3 and also honored to be the president of Nevada League of Cities this year. And you were elected president last year. What month was that? President in uh, October at the conference in Henderson. That's great. Last but not least, we have Gene here. I'm Gene, <coughs> excuse me, I'm Gene Brockman. Uh, I'm the town board chairman from Incline Village. I'm third vice president of the League of Cities and uh, generally represent the smaller cities in the state. That's great. I think first off for our viewers, I thought it would be a good idea to explain just what the League does. We work on legislative issues and especially now more than ever, we need to be working with our state elected officials because we've got some challenges obviously with revenue sources, but in economic development projects and with our unemployment rate so high and foreclosure rate, now is the time to work together and that's the mission of the League of Cities. Is every part of Nevada represented by the League of Cities? Yes, we have 25 member cities, and that's why we all work together um, to accomplish those missions. Good idea. If each one of you talked about why you're so passionate about being a part of the league. We have actually few cities in Nevada, if you will, for the size of the state that we are, area-wise. But we also exchange ideas. The bigger cities understand the interests, these problems that small communities have that we're all unique and so we work together trying to protect each other from the legislature, if you will, and also educate the legislature on the different uh, issues that we have that are similar in nature, but yet so different because of population and sizes of the communities that we serve. At this level of government, we're in the neighborhoods. We're talking to the people of this state and in our, in our cities. It also gives us a good idea of what's happening what the heartbeat of Nevada truly is. Yep. Um, certainly not to take anything away from our legislators, but uh, we're the people in the street, we're the front line. And when someone has a problem, they call us first. When I first started to attend uh, the, the meetings, the annual meetings and so forth, was the educational opportunities that there were as an elected official to understand how to better serve, to get together with other, other people um, from around the state and learn what they were doing. Uh, and in try and incorporate some of those good ideas in my own community and also learn generally about uh, everything from open meeting law to I mean the, the open exchange of, of ideas um, with there's actually some educational courses that taught through the, through UNR that uh, that actually will help your your elected officials to be more informed and better, better officials. That's a good point because nobody really teaches you how to be a council person. No it's a matter of you know really working cohesively as cities. The large cities, 
the smaller cities, and not just living within our own silos, realizing that we all represent people and we all represent constituents for Nevada. At the end of the day, we're all residents of Nevada and we want to make sure that our state is the is the greatest state that it can possibly be. And how can we do that if in fact we only care about our own individual communities whom we represent, but more so looking at it from, from a holistic approach as far as what's best for Nevada. Because what's best for those residents in Las Vegas you know, ultimately affects those residents in other communities. And so we want to make sure that we work collectively so that we're not overshadowing one another, but working collectively to basically raise the entire state as a whole. I can tell you're all a very passionate group. I would be really remiss if I didn't talk about the economic downturn in the economy. All of you represent different parts of the state. I thought we'd go around the room and talk about the economic development programs that each of you have going to try to turn the situation around. Well, when it comes to economic development, you know, one of the um, strongholds as far as uh, the ward in which I represent has the majority of all uh, development or economic development taking place, specifically in the downtown, which I represent a large portion of downtown and the inner core of uh, the older portions of the city of Las Vegas. And, and um, one of the fortunate um, elements of the city of Las Vegas is that we have uh, hundreds of millions of dollars going into uh, various developments throughout our downtown and inside of our neighborhoods. And, um, and that within itself uh, provides a level of income and taxes coming back into the city for us to continue to work on the infrastructure as well as provide necessary uh, programs in order to keep our economy afloat in the city of Las Vegas. How about you, Dave? I understand Mesquite is full of golf courses. Uh, we're, we're a, we primarily are a tourist-based economy uh, in Mesquite as well as a, a retirement community. Um, so we've suffered during the you know these, these past few years. Obviously, uh, home construction uh, and gaming. Uh, our our uh, our unemployment rate is is a little slightly higher than the state average uh, right now. We've had some layoffs in the casinos and so forth. But despite that, people continue to come to come to Mesquite. Uh, our weather, being in southern Nevada, our weather, our climate is is very hospitable um, throughout throughout most of the year. We don't get snow. We don't. We stay we stay pretty uh, pretty warm throughout the year, uh, very much like Las Vegas. And so we continue to get golf uh, golfers. Um, we actually had a, a couple of years ago uh, a Sun City Anthem project uh, retirement community with Pulte Homes opened up uh, 6,000 units, uh, 6,000 homes. Um, so far they've built about 700, give or take. Um, so they do continue, even though it's slow, they continue to build and sell homes. And just recently, just a few months ago, they had their grand opening of their 18 championship 18 hole golf course there wow. as well. So it's a beautiful, it's, a, it's an amazing course. And I, I believe if I've got them counted in my head, I think that's nine courses for our little our little city. So wow. nine, nine 18 hole golf courses. So it is, a, we've got challenges just like the rest of the state. Mike, we hear a lot about Elko. The mining industry there is in a sort of a boom because of the cost of gold. Are you having your challenges as well? Elko does have its challenges. We had a downturn 12 years ago with mining, and so it's finally bounced back into being a, a good portion of our economy. Uh, we're seeing the, the reduction in tourism traffic, which hurts the casinos as well as the hotels. But over the last couple of years, and we worked with the legislature with the county, and we just had the grand opening of a rail port out in Elko that has now a couple of businesses out there that are somewhat mining related, but nevertheless is part of our diversification efforts. And currently we're seeing pipes being delivered, I mean, substantial amount of pipes uh, <laughs> for this Ruby uh, gas line project that's coming out of Wyoming through Nevada up to Oregon and then feeding California. So it's a huge project. It's a multi-billion dollar project. And uh, so that's gonna give some stability, if you will, for the short term in northern Nevada, not specifically Elko, but it goes along I-80 where they're mm -hmm. going to have staging points, and Elko is one of those staging points because of the area that we have at the rail port that we, we can store the pipes for delivering, uh, to deliver, be delivered in different locations where the pipeline is going to be laid. So that's a, we're fortunate. Uh, our unemployment rate is 8.1 percent, and we're fortunate. But mining isn't growing with more employees. They've been stable for years and years. 
which is good for us. So we're no longer a transient population that we were 12 years ago. It's no secret Nevada is at the top of that list yeah. in regards to foreclosures. But that being said, we also, uh, I, like many of us, look at the economic indicators of today. Uh, recently, um, home sales are on a rise. And that's, that's an economic indicator. Likewise, the median price of a home in Southern Nevada has risen a couple of percentage points. And that's that too great. is a good sign. Um, more recently, uh, numbers from McCarran International Airport, our visitor volume has kind of stabilized. Anytime you go downtown in the city of Las Vegas or on Las Vegas Boulevard, there are lots and lots of people there. We are still a destination state. North and south, it matters not. So those are good economic indicators. We're coming out of this. I just hope, hope we do it sooner than later. Uh, our, our main uh, task is to keep people coming to our area to use our facilities. As long as that happens, we will maintain a healthy economy. You were lucky you had a great ski season. We had the second best ski season of the year That's great. Uh, at Diamond Peak, which the village owns. We exceeded 120,000 visitors and uh, we've had an outstanding year. But it goes along with how much snow there is. <laughs> and it's an end. we still have snow that is wonderful. <laughs> Jessica, I saved you for last. As of the taping of this show, the Reno Aces just had their first home game of their second season. So I thought this would be a very positive note for you to start on. We did. We've we've spearheaded several economic development projects. The baseball's just one of them, and they did have their uh, opening season game last night. Um, they're building on uh, with retail into their phases, which is helping with the redevelopment and, and transformation of downtown. But in addition to that, the council's really been focused on renewable energy projects. We've spearheaded many initiatives and it really comes down to thinking differently. Um, we were able to put solar panels on our public buildings um, without additional uh, taxes um, that were being implemented. We did that from the savings um, that was generated from those power costs. We're also putting wind turbines on top of City Hall here next month. So we put a great emphasis on what we can do as far as renewable energy companies um, throughout the state. Um, not just here in Reno, but I think uh, Nevada has a tremendous opportunity with all the resources that we have here. We're gonna take a short break right now. And when we come back, we're gonna talk some more to the members of the Nevada League of Cities and get their views on what they think is going to happen with the upcoming legislative session. So stay tuned. <laughs> You promised me the world. Is this what you had in mind? Every choice we make has a consequence. Help Earthshare and its members restore balance to the world. Visit earthshare.org and see what you can do. Earthshare, one environment, one simple way to care for it. So, uh, Malcolm, you do know that energy savers last six times longer than ordinary light bulbs. Well, this isn't my room. It's Baron Davis's. Baron Davis, the basketball player? This is his room? Yep. Interesting, because we have Baron Davis right here. Baron, do you live here? No. I don't mean that, Baron Davis. Millions of kids are using their energy wisely. What's your excuse? Welcome back to our program. We've been talking to the executive board of the Nevada League of Cities, of which Councilmember Jessica Sferraza is the president. And before we went to the break, we were talking about economic development. And I think we want to pick up that discussion a little bit more. Uh, Steve, what's going on in Las Vegas with economic development? There are so many things going on in the city of Las Vegas, and most of them in Councilor Barlow's board, uh, <laughs> thanks to his good leadership. <laughs> right now, and almost finished, is the Lou Ruvo Brain Institute, which is a significant uh, mark in the city of Las Vegas in the downtown redevelopment area. You know, you know full well that Mayor Goodman and the Las Vegas City Council, we've been diehard on working on a redevelopment plans for the city of Las Vegas, and it's coming to fruition. After years of work, it's happening. The Blue Rubo Brain Institute, uh, 
We are build, building a brand new state-of-the-art city hall, uh, certainly employing uh, hundreds and hundreds of construction workers, the Smith Performing Arts Center. Am I missing anything, Councilman? Well, also we're working with the Cordish Group. Um, we're looking to, after we build the, the new city hall, we're looking uh, working with the Cordish Group to bring an arena into the downtown community, which will basically really, in my opinion, uh, do just what the Staples Center, Center has done for Los Angeles, and that's really uh, bringing a lot more uh, impact of economic development. What kind of downtown. sports? Well, right now we're looking at basketball. Great. Yeah. And if I can add to that, Councilman, the Reno City Council and Mayor Cashel have been phenomenal with this new stadium, and I know she mentioned that in the previous segment, but that's been a transformation in yeah. the city of Reno, in downtown Reno. When, when I toured that facility, and Mayor Cashel took me out on the balcony and said, now watch, the game hasn't started yet. And I saw people coming from the downtown area to the ball game. It helped those downtown mm -hmm. operators, it helped those casinos Businesses. and those small businesses in the downtown area. We're trying to emulate, and we're trying to follow in those footsteps. Are you all concerned of what's going to happen in this upcoming legislative session? Before the special session, uh, uh, the city leaders from Reno, Sparks, and Washoe County held a news conference and pretty much told the legislature, please don't take any more of our money. And, and they didn't uh, during that special session. But we've got a, a, a regular session not too far off. Maybe start with you, Jessica. Are there some concerns? We're always concerned as citizens um, and elected officials at the local government level. And I think Councilman Ross said it well. We're the heartbeat, the pulse of the community because we meet frequently. Um, most of us meet weekly or bi-weekly, so we're closest to our constituents. That being said though, we what we want to do is we all want to work together. We want to work with our state elected officials because we're all um, struggling through these hard economic times, but we got to look far out into the future as well. What are we going to do to stabilize our economy, get people to come work in the state? And that's very important because just like the state, we have services that we must provide at the local level. So what our ideas are is to come forward, work with our legislative leaders before the next session so we can all work together to make Nevada a better place. Is that part of what the league does? You'll, you'll hold individual meetings with different legislators? Well, I think uh, Gene and both the mayor talked about the collectiveness of uh, the nature of that and how we operate with our legislators. I think this last session, uh, the emergency session and the previous session certainly a wake-up call because of this economy. We have got to do things differently in this state, mm -hmm. without a doubt. And I think that driving message is going to be heard and resonated mostly from the cities and the counties of the state of Nevada to help our lawmakers reformulate our tax structure, uh, take a good look at how we generate revenue both locally and, and statewide. This has been a tough lesson for a lot of our lawmakers and now we're going to have new ones, freshman lawmakers, yeah. that are stepping into uh, uh, a fire. And that's what it's really coming down to. But we need to be there collectively as cities and counties to support them and help guide the direction of the state of Nevada. The last couple of sessions, because of the term limit aspect of losing legislatures, losing that institutional knowledge, and at the same time, we've got councilmen that are in the same position, you're losing that institutional knowledge that can't be replaced that quickly and it's a detriment to governments and to the state of Nevada. What we've done in the past, in the last couple of sessions with the mayors, we've been meeting, and because as Steve has said, you know, when the problem got in a community, they call up the mayors or they call up the city hall, they don't call up anyone else. And so we do represent the majority of the population of the state of Nevada. So we've been meeting on an annual basis with the mayors just to stay ahead of the, the issues, on top of the issues, and try to communicate some of the concerns that we may have that we see coming up in the next session or subsequent sessions. So it's on the radar screen for the elected officials at that level as well as the communication and the collaboration that we have as, as local governments and as well as mayors. Met here in, yes. in uh, Carson City we did. To, um, to come up with a game plan as far as a plan of action in order to speak with the governor mm -hmm. to you know express it upon he and his team, you know, the importance of not basically taking from the, you know, the cities, and, uh, the local cities and counties coffers um, because of the impact that we were already feeling at the local level. And I believe that that message that the mayors took to the governor this past January was very effective because 
uh, during the special session, none of the cities nor the counties uh, were affected in that respect. So I believe that that was a very good um, uh, example. That's a very good example as to how, in fact, when all mayors from around the state of Nevada come together on one accord and take a message to the legislature, that it, it does really play a very important role. Well, Did during the during the last two years, actually, uh, the the mayor's group that Mike and Mayor Mike from Elko and I have both participated in, we've met with both the Senate and the Assembly leadership, uh, Senator Horsford and Assemblywoman Buckley. We met with them several times. Uh, we've met with Governor Gibbons to provide uh, direct input to them from the collective city group. And uh, I believe they were quite appreciative of the perspective that we were able to give them uh, during the last uh, number of months leading up to the special uh, special session. We will be continuing to meet uh, leading up to next uh, next term or, or the next session. But uh, that's an example of how the cities are getting together it's and uh, producing results. Coming upon us as elected officials, it's already been talked about here. Um, we're, we are where the rubber meets the road, okay? I mean, we really are. When, yeah. when there's a pothole, when trash pickup is, is yeah. affected, uh, water, um, sewer, I mean, those are the things, parks, recreation, kids, little leagues, baseball, those are the things that we, on a daily basis, are dealing with and that are the public, ha they have a huge impact on the daily lives of, our, of the public. At the state, at the state legislature, at their level, at the state level, they're not really dealing with those day-to-day, -day, a lot of those day-to-day -day, uh, problematic kinds of, kinds of services. We are, and it's incumbent upon us as elected officials to be able to take that message to the legislature, to them, um, every time they meet, and help remind them and help them understand, look, if you make these decisions at this macro level up here, it hurts us or it affects our constituents down here on this level, and it's it, it, taking the time from Mesquite, it's quite, it's a, it's a travel, taking the time to go all the way to the legislature to give them a message is, is really important. And I find that the legislators, most of them, yes. to the person, are very, very appreciative of that. Uh, they talk to they talk to lobbyists all the time. They talk to different you know different interest groups all the time. When they actually get a citizen, um, whether that be an elected or, or not, actually to go to Carson City and speak with them and talk to them about some of the issues and problems and their decisions and how those are going to affect us at a local level, very effective. And and that's what I enjoy about the League of Cities is it kind of helps us, gives us that platform to. to so what you're saying is once they know what's going on, they listen, they pay attention. I find that most of the legislators that, in, in the issues that we have over the years, and again, it's, this, will, this will be my sixth legislative sessions going uh, this coming year, I find that all, they're very respectful, they always listen, and, and with their staff and, and LCB, they generally try and find something, a win-win that, that works for everybody. We mentioned the tax structure. Do you have some ideas on how to change the tax structure? <laughs> Who wants to address that one? Well, actually, uh, we were discussing earlier before we, before we start doing this, and it's been an issue that's been out there for years, and it's related to depreciation of, of property. That there is ways to solve it with, without doing something drastic that really holds a lot of people harmless, it doesn't upset the status quo. It goes forward in the future that allows additional growth and revenues that can be reallocated, you know, that to cover the cost of education, cost of government. Uh, that every time a home gets sold, basically, that the value that's sold for would be the new basis on depreciation. It was explored years ago by other mayors, uh, especially in Reno, because it was a concern of the deteriorating infrastructure downtown, at least to the homes, that it makes sense. So those that want to live in a house long-term get the benefits of depreciation. Those that could afford to, to buy and sell on a, on a more often basis would pay the associated tax rates based on the sales price of the home. So there's, there's ways to do it if we just you know, get together collectively and not react to what we're doing, which has been the case at the legislative session for years, is we don't solve problems, we react to it, and we band-aid it. So you know, if we're gonna think outside yeah. the box, what a great opportunity and what a great time it is to do it. And I think it's absolutely important that we explore things that 
don't upset the apple cart per se and just disrupt the economic climate that we have, but inhibits opportunity, inhibits growth, and makes it successful in the long term. And that's what we have to look at, is the long term fix, not the short term band-aid effect. Well, and, and look at so the, the state's largest employers, for example, gaming and mining. We cannot continue to tax exactly. more gaming and more mining. Um, we have really got to take a hard look at more of a broad-based business tax approach instead of putting all our eggs in one basket and expecting that that basket's never going to fall out of your hand. And every time we have a shortfall, we run back to those two industries and right. expect them to, to take, take it up. And if I may add on, on mining, because mining's out in the rural, uh, too many people associate mining being strictly gold. And mining is throughout Nevada. And there's many other minerals that are extracted. And some people probably don't realize that salt is under mm -hmm. the mining aspect that would be taxed differently and stuff like that. So just because a segment of society is doing good because the society alone has caused it to do good because the economic collapse worldwide has increased the price of gold, there's no, there's no, there's no evidence in the historical data that's going to maintain that level once the economy picks back up. So to put all your eggs in one basket, then it falls again, then we've lost that s sustainability, and, it's, and I think it's fair. So Steve is actually right about looking at more something broad-based that isn't industry-specific, and because those industry-specific taxes are always a fluctuating aspect because there's no guarantee that industry is going to sustain that revenue stream year on and year in and year out. If you look at the Pew report that what came out that? that said it basically studied uh, the state of Nevada, um, where we are in this recession, they say that we're going to be one of the last states out of the recession because of the way the revenue structure is in the state, because we've relied on gaming, because we've relied on the construction industry for so long to fill the state coffers. So we've got to truly look at that diversification. Um, because we can't keep going back to that same well. Because as we know, um, gaming, especially tourism, those numbers have sharply declined. And that overall has affected uh, the state's revenue system. Uh, the last thing anybody wants to do here, we look at those cuts to education, um, not just at the K through 12, but also um, in higher education. So this has got to be a discussion. And I think um, the councilman had brought it up about how the Band-Aid approach, doing this Band-Aid approach, that's why we're saying as a, the League of Cities this year, we want to come to the table and be part of the solution. Solution. So we're going to start working on those solutions now um, before uh, the next legislative session. We're going to take another break, but we're going to come back and bring up this discussion again because it's very important for the future of Nevada. Folks, why won't we go to the doctor? My uncle called, speech all slurred, complaining his arms numb. He called everyone. He even called my daughter Tierra, because, you know, she's got a year of nursing. <laughs> everyone thinks he needs to go to the doctor, including me. So he said, well, will you take me? I'm like, I'm on the road. He goes, I'll wait. <laughs> Stroke's no joke. If you or someone you love have symptoms of stroke, don't wait. It may be too late. Dial 911. Time loss is brain loss. Up your head. What are you doing? I'm not going to lie. Definitely not easy. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Just got to get through the day. How do you stop it? Being used to doing something with a cigarette. Makes it hard doing it without one. If I can relearn to get through my work day without cigarettes, mm -hmm. I can relearn anything without cigarettes. Relearn life without cigarettes. Free at becomeanx.org. A new way to think about quitting. Welcome back to our program. We've got the executive board of the Nevada League of Cities here at Reno City Hall because Jessica Sferaz, our council person, is the president. And we've been having a great discussion on what Nevada wants to be in the future. And maybe Steve, we'll start off with you. Well, I, I recently attended a breakfast meeting with the Brookings Institute, who is now partnered with the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, to have discussions about what Nevada wants to be when we grow up. And it was an interesting discussion. <laughs> the Green Spuns uh, hosted the breakfast meeting. Uh, Senator Copening uh, was in attendance, as was uh, Speaker Buckley. And it was a lively discussion about how do we rethink Nevada? Where are we going from today to tomorrow? And what three things do we really focus on that will really affect the state, take us into the next century, you know, solidify uh, uh, 
things for our families and for our businesses. And it was a lively discussion to see how we get there. It focused on, the, on three things. Uh, education, uh, bringing more manufacturing into the state, and the state of Nevada, Mayor, being that energy provider to the rest of the country, which we can do in renewable energy resources. We've got tons and tons of them. About 10 miles out uh, north of Mesquite, it's actually located in Lincoln County, there was a site, a uh, proposed site, for a coal-fired power plant. Uh, very large, very, I mean, supposedly clean, but again, it was gonna burn coal. We, we're a tourist-based economy. We were very happy about it. Um, there were a number of groups, local groups, that actually lobbied a little bit against it and so forth. Well, along those lines, about two, three weeks ago, the parent company, it, that location, the particular location, was only about a mile away from uh, the Kern River pipeline, the natural gas pipeline. And so all, they came back and said, well, okay, so we won't do, we're not gonna do coal fire. What we're gonna do is we'll burn cleaner natural gas and we're gonna build a solar component to this power plant as well. Why? Because we get solar 325 days out of the year. I mean, we get sunlight. And so um, it's those kind, it's that kind of thinking and it's that kind of, so you have this huge Blackstone group, Scythe Global, that was gonna you know, build this huge, uh, ugly power plant, um, coal fire power plant, and they've changed their thinking. And it's gonna be much cleaner and, and actually gonna have a renewable component. They're gonna produce 100 meg, um, megawatts, I think is the, the terminology, of, of solar in, in renewable, renewable energy right outside of Mesquite. It's gonna put a ton of people to work, and it's, it's gonna fabulous. be way cleaner. So. You know Nevada's got all this expansive land, a lot of it desert, You've got so many counties, and every county is in some state of economic downturn and, and distress. <coughs> California being the seventh or eighth lar top ten largest economies in the world, don't want to do any additional power capacity because of perceptions, no matter which way you do it, outside of uh, certain green uh, energies, solar, wind, those types of things. Nevada actually could be a gateway if we look outside the box on, on developing an energy system that feeds the West, if you will, and basically putting places or, or these types of facilities, be it natural gas-fired facilities, clean coal when it gets to, to that technology, nuclear, uh, renewables, uh, even biofuels uh, by putting areas that they could develop the biofuel to burn and such, and spread that through each county and stabilize those counties that are the weakest and enhance those that are the strongest. And then I know that the energy companies in Nevada are trying to interconnect the north and the south with yep. power lines. We should connect the north and the south with gas lines as well. So the infrastructure in the state of Nevada is our more than likely our limiting resource to expand and grow and diversify further. But we could also take advantage of the lack of diversification or expansion to our adjoining states because of the environmental concerns that people there, the leadership there, have that they're afraid to, to do what's right for them. Public that league is so important because it gives all of the cities uh, in the rules as well as the, the bigger cities and counties a, an opportunity to come together to talk about how we can fix a lot of the problems statewide, not just once again concentrating on our own local areas, but how can we fix problems and bring very thoughtful and creative ideas to the table such as what you know, the, the mayor and the council members brought forward. And I believe this is where the dialogue begins, just through communication of sitting at the round table and figuring out how, in fact, we can regionalize a lot of the things that we've been doing on our own individual <coughs> local levels, but how we can now do it at a state level that will be more impactful for all of us as a whole. A small community like Incline Village uh, may not have space for um, wind turbines or solar energy. However, we can contribute to this as we are doing through uh, one of the environmental uh, science centers of the West at Sierra Nevada College. Uh, it's a cooperative venture of uh, UC Davis, uh, the Desert Research Institute, and the college providing uh, state-of-the-art study on uh, environmental issues. Of course, we're on the shore of Lake Tahoe and have a huge national asset to uh, protect there as they're doing. But um, that's, that's our kind of contribution. Uh, 
we like to feed that through the Nevada League as well. And that leads to my next question is, um, one of the things that you mentioned in what does Nevada want to be when it grows up, the, the education component. Uh, what are some of the ideas that you have? Focused on education. How do we plan to lure those manufacturing, high-tech companies, how do we plan on alluring them to the state of Nevada? We already know we have a very uh, desirable tax structure for businesses. We already know that, and that's on purpose. So we do lure those companies. But without that educational system to back that up, we're missing the mark. We have every resource we need in the state of Nevada. And as, as you guys are having that discussion, you made me think of something. We're not the north. On the Nevada League of Cities, we're not the north and the south. We're, yep. Nevada. Nevada. We're Nevada. And that's what's very important yeah. as we, as we have Absolutely. Oh, along those lines, not only Nevada should not only reap the benefits of solar, geotherm, um, uh, wind turbine, we should not only reap the benefits of producing that power, but we should reap the benefits of the manufacturing companies mm -hmm. that actually build those components, that actually you know produce those and set those up in the state of Nevada. Yeah, and, that's, and you can't get that without education, you, with, yeah. with qualified people to build, to, to design and build those things. If you look at the unemployment numbers in the building trades, we, we're not just talking new jobs here, we need new careers and really transforming those manufacturing jobs, going from the building of, of homes, we're never gonna see that boom um, cycle again to the manufacturing jobs. And if you look at the statistics in the state, over 60% of the enrollees in the higher educational system are at the community college level. So I think we have a tremendous opportunity not to just be the resource hub of renewable energy, but also teach people from all the, across the country how to build a solar panel wind turbine, um, these types of things. We have some of the most sophisticated trade schools here in the state of Nevada. Um, we have skilled trades. You go and you tour those facilities, what they've been able to do. There's no reason we can't do that here. And I think the second opportunity we have is in the medical field. Um, as the councilman said from Las Vegas, what they're doing with the Lou Rubo Center, truly state of the art um, for uh, brain diseases and, and how to cure those and really becoming with the emphasis from the current administration in the medical field, why can't we be looking at a medical hub to have those records in place here in the state of Nevada? If you look at our fiber optic lines, um, if you look at our location, there's no reason we can't be thinking differently about attracting uh, new companies to our region. Councilwoman, I I neglected to mention, I think both of us neglected, the well, not, the, not only the Mom Museum and, and yeah. part of a redevelopment, but when she mentioned the Rubo Brain Institute, the Cleveland Clinic, Clinic. has partnered Huge. with them. <coughs> so Boy, there's no hospital. reason any Nevadan should have to, have to leave the state to get state-of-the-art health care. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, great. And that's, that's incredible. Well, we've got to take another break. This is such a lively <laughs> discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but we're we're going we're gonna to take a break, and we'll be right back. This financial advisor is being accused of committing one of the largest investment frauds in the history of the United States. I guess we're not going to Aspen. That's fine. You see, I like tennis balls. He likes insider trading. So he's going to jail and I'm going to a shelter. And no, they're not the same thing. Shelters are for good pets that want to be adopted. Jails are for criminals. I've done nothing. Uh-oh. Okay, I stole a cheeseburger once on my dog. Must be Foreclosure is hard on every member of the family. Well, if you're struggling you. with your mortgage, there is help. Come on, Anna. To learn about the government's Making Home Affordable program, visit makinghomeaffordable.gov or call 1-888-995-HOPE to speak to a HUD-approved housing counselor. It's free of charge. A bright future starts with a healthy lifestyle. Good nutrition and physical activity are fuel for your child's mind and body. a boy, Pano. And the food pyramid will help you find the right balance. <laughs> Just remember, every color, every day. Nothing can stop me now. Eat right. Here's an effort. Be active. Come on, I'll race you home. Make it balanced. These cards for a celebration. A healthy lifestyle can lead to great things for your child. Visit MyPyramid.gov to learn more. Welcome back to our program. We've got quite a think tank here 
of uh, elected officials from cities all over Nevada. We've been talking about what Nevada wants to be when it grows up, whether there's a need to change the state's tax structure. And I thought we should talk about home rule. Why not? We've been talking about everything else. I'm sure you folks have some opinions on home rule. Maybe Jessica, you could start off oh, by explaining, start yeah, off explaining discussion. what it is, what it is exactly. Well, what it is, we operate under Dillon's rule here in the state of Nevada. Um, what we want to do is really uh, work with our leg legislators this year to come out because what we're we want to make sure that some of the issues that the city has that we need to change or have greater authority over, we have to wait until the legislature's in session every two years. So that's caused some challenges for local governments, not just the cities, but the counties across the state. So we're in discussions right now um, before the next session um, to look at some possible modifications um, that would give the, the cities greater and the counties greater control. So let me get this right. Anytime you want to um, get anything passed that involves uh, a state law, you have to go to the legislature? Yeah, and really we're creatures of the state legislature. I tell people um, <laughs> that, and it goes back to what Councilman Ross said again about being the closest to the people, heartbeat away. Some of these issues, we, in order to change them to wait every two years when the, the councils meet weekly to bi-weekly, um, it's, it's challenging for us. So we're working again with the legislature to, to resolve these issues. Well, what's it going to take to change that? Well, I think it, it's going to uh, require a, a, an exact understanding of what's involved both at the local level and at the legislative level uh, and what the asset or what the liabilities are of making changes or what the advantages are. And I think, I think um, this group will be able to provide a number of advantages of um, changing to uh, a more dispersed uh, authority level. Efficiency, Efficiency at, the, at the local yeah. level and, um, and possibly even cost savings to some extent um, depending on how you know in fact you know things um, move should it move in that direction of, of the cities having more a little bit more control over how in fact we um, formulate our, our policies and procedures on a local level. Is it unusual to do most states that the individual cities have a lot more control over what happens? <clears throat> In several the states they do. They, um, the cities have the rule and the legislature does not. And, uh, it's interesting to note as we talk about the Nevada tomorrow, to Nevada growing up, <laughs> And, and economically and in diversifying our economy, we also need to have that conversation of how do we govern now? How does the Nevada legislature govern? How do the local uh, governments govern? Mm -hmm. And there has to be that discussion in regards to you know, giving some of the cities the ability to govern themselves a little more because the legislature only meets uh, once every two years. There was an example, these guys haven't thrown it out there, but there was an example of this, I think the last legislative session where the city of Las Vegas or Clark County, well, the city of Las Vegas had to, had to, get, had to change, is that Clark County? They had to change a parking issue, uh, um, change the law for a parking issue to do some assessments or something like that. And they couldn't do it themselves, fairly minor thing. They had to wait for the legislature to get in session and then do a bill draft request. And it had to go through all the committees and it had to go through both houses and then get signed into law just so they could fix their, Clark County could fix their little uh, parking issue. And so those are, the, those are the kinds of things that we're talking about. We're not talking about, you know, wide-ranging, hey, we get to make every decision, but we'd like to start having that dialogue with the legislature about certain structural things uh, within, in each city that we could do that would not only make our life easier, but also their life easier by cutting down on some, some bill draft requests. And, and there's actually an interim, some interim studies being, being performed, some committees meeting. Um, that are discussing some of these very issues right now. I know Mike wanted to say something. Yeah, I was going to say a simple thing is the city is looking at, because of the economy, is changing our election cycle to be consistent with the county and the state cycle, which is in the, which is in the, uh, this current year, the odd year, even year, and all that. But we have to get legislative approval for that. But when you do, whenever you send a simple bill like that to the legislature that we have no control over, usually you see attachments to get to it, and no longer are we going to support it when because something else gets attached, then it becomes a bill that doesn't get to any 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 feed up to it. And so, but that's the things we have to go through to change small things in our charters and such like that 
have to be done by the legislative. So we're looking at things that would be more simplified for us that don't have a, a financial attachment to it by the state of Nevada or any financial consequences or the fact that we want to go out there and, and increase taxes outside of state control. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking at simple things that make us run more efficient. We are the gateway to the public. We are the first responders to everything that happens in the community. And therefore, if we had the tools to, to even do it better, then give it to us. <laughs> and, I, and I've got to say, this is probably the best time in the state's history to make these changes because of the economic downturn, because of the challenges we've all faced. This may be the best time to take advantage of this, to restructure that, that whole thing. Each community is different in their needs, and this is being discussed at the school district now. Um, actually, the proposal by the governor and also gubernatorial candidates about having the, the school districts have destiny over their own control. I mean, what happens in each individual community is different, and having that, that ability to be able to make those decisions is exactly the kinds of things we're looking at at the city level as well. I mean, we all want to work together, and we have different issues, but having each community um, be able to have control, um, you know, to the extent of what we do with neighborhoods in the public, I think is very important. Did you want to add something, Jean? No, they're, they're covering it very well. <laughs> <laughs> Better than I could. Which leads to my next question. Can you give us any idea of what kind of bills you'll be taking before the legislature uh, for the league? We, get a, we kind of get a list of, of, of proposed bill drafts that each city, each community put, kind of puts forward, puts together. And, uh, and then we sit down as a group um, in our business meeting there and actually make those decisions. Let's put this one forward, let's put that one forward, we vote on it and so forth. So, I, I mean, those final decisions won't be made until it's August, um, and we're actually meeting, our annual meeting this year is actually in Reno. Oh, that's great. Um, here, so we'll, we'll be making those final decisions then, I think. So You'll be able to go to a, a Reno Aces baseball game. Yes. Right yes. We want to make sure our bill draft requests pass, and, and also the local jurisdictions. So we're kind of taking a different approach. We want to meet with them first before we sponsor anything to make sure that we flush flush it out, flush out the language, and it's something that we can get, carry forward and actually get an agreement and get it into law. We as the Nevada League want to be helpful. Oh. We want to support them in these tough decision-making processes. And we want to be part of the solution. You're going to have new legislators, a lot of tough issues. And as we talked about earlier in the show, this group has already been meeting with electeds and, right. and plans to continue to meet with electeds so that there are no surprises. And, Sharon, and let me say this also. This is this time more so than any other time, I believe, in Nevada State's history. Um, Nevada League needs to be on one page as we move forward. Yeah. communicating with the governor and the legislature as to our needs because if we don't come as one unified group we will receive something uh, of the unknown in all of our cities and counties <laughs> and so it's very important that we that we're on the same page and that's why we're walking very diligently with each city um, through the Nevada League uh, leadership to make sure that our issues from our respective cities are on the table and the Nevada League as a body uh, makes a decision as to what bills will be carried forward uh, as one unified effort in order to communicate very diligently and directly to the legislature the importance of the bills and, and why in fact we stand behind them as a, on, a, on one unified front. I just think you've seen here today we have I, I've just enjoyed so much working with all the elected officials from the different jurisdictions and I think what it points out to the public there's a true sense of community here in our state in the state of Nevada and and truly what we want to do is is all work together um, for solutions as we move forward I want to thank you Jean thank you as well <laughs> and Mike thank you for being with us good luck with everything in Elko and Dave Thank you. Learn something new about Mesquite. <laughs> and Steve and Ricky from Las Vegas. It sounds Thank like you. Las Vegas is making a big turnaround. We're moving. We're and doing Jessica, the best we can. Yeah, Jessica, it's always great to have you Thank on you. this Council Connection. And thank you all for joining us. I knew it wasn't going to be easy. Some things take a while to come back. Three, two, champions! Champions! 
but I've got some good buddies. I guess they're helping me figure it out. Being used to doing something with a cigarette makes it hard to do it without one. But if I can relearn to hang out with my friends without cigarettes, then I can relearn anything without cigarettes. Relearn life without cigarettes. Free at becomeanx.org. A new way to think about quitting. There's a place not so far away. Ask your parents to take you. Come to the forest, where the other you lives. But first, stop by discovertheforest.org.